what I want to talk about is why and how memorials are changing. Memorials today are not really conceived as objects, singular objects as we see here, as much as they are unfolding events, moving compositions. Now, like our friend George M. Cohen here in Times Square, I'm from Rhode Island, I'm a Yankee, a Yankee doodle dandy, as Cohen wrote in one of his songs. He also wrote Over There, a popular song during the First World War. Now he competes for the public's attention with a billboard advertising a new movie called Over There. He's also competing with the McDonald's sign, of course, street signage, street noise, which you know in Times Square is, is considerable. We've got the bodacious Doug girls at the very top. You know, today memorials are squeezed into a crowded urban infrastructure. They are vulnerable to invisibility. Memorials have to compete for the public's increasingly short attention span. This is a piece by Ellen Green and Dragset, two very witty uh, Scandinavian artists who are now living in Berlin. It's a takeoff, obviously, of Robert Indiana's ubiquitous love sculpture from the 1960s. And I'm showing it to you because this memorial does not exist in physical form. The work itself is color print. The letters are a digital construction. You know, it's, it's uh, it, like many new memorials, it's being shaped by the virtual world. Another influence on memorial change is the you are there intensity that pervades many new memorials. The public's demand to know exactly where Martin Luther King Jr. gave his famous I Have a Dream speech on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial was so great that the Park Service, using films and photographs, figured out exactly where he was standing. And if you can see at the bottom there, there's a bronze inset now into, on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. Some of this has to do with the Ken Burns approach to history. It's all up close and personal. We're reading diaries, we're seeing photographs, we're seeing letters. This has had, Ken Burns has had a tremendous amount of influence on how uh, we perceive and express history these days. What should be commemorated? What should be commemorated publicly? What are we entitled to look at? The point is, is there is no longer a shared consensus about what should be commemorated or what design vocabulary should be used. You know, the days, the days of classicism where a figure or a statue or a temple or a, a reflecting pool could stand in for 10,000, those days are over. Why? Well, there are so many people who have say today in what a memorial is going to look like. <coughs> Some people prefer figuration, realistic sculpture. <coughs> Other people would rather have the memorial be a park where they can sit and contemplate. Still others want to see the artifacts of the tragedy as proof of what was survived. And if you've been following um, Ground Zero at all, this is the, the massive 165 foot piece of the, the World Trade Tower that was left. Um, if you've been following that, you know that what we ultimately will get will be a compound memorial that combines all of these things Configuration, abstraction, a park, and artifacts. It's also a great project in that it talks about the spaces in between. You know, those are the things that I'm interested in. The space between the citizen and the memorial. The space between memorials and cities. Between the historic event and the present moment and the future. Everything that is soft rather than hard about memorial design. Here's a figurative piece by Meredith Bergman, a New York sculptor. She was asked to create a piece along Boston's Commonwealth Avenue Mall. And Meredith went and walked down that mall, and if you know it, you know it is absolutely crowded with, with monuments. All of them male, all of them white, and all of them very, very high on their pedestals. So <laughs> Meredith decided to subvert that, um, the traditional role of the pedestal at her women do not stand in heroic idleness. Far from it, they have gotten off, they are putting their pedestals to good use. Monuments are being amended to reflect the perspectives of populations that were previously ignored. And they also reflect lifestyle changes. 
Franklin Delano Roosevelt told his friend, Supreme Court Justice Felix Frankfurter, if they're to put up a memorial to me, I should like to be placed in the center of that green plot in front of the archives building. I should like it to consist of a block about the size of this desk. This actually happened. Frankfurter records this. FDR slapped his desk. Well, in fact, he does have that. This is the National Archives building. You can see the tablet about desk size right in front. But he got a lot more than that. Over a period of 60 years, he got seven acres on the National Mall. Hugely, a huge debate. You know, the other thing, I'm not going to get in, into this today, really, but, you know, we see these memorials and we're not conscious of what it took to bring them into being. This, this was 60 years of controversy. Well, I guess you can get a sense of that just from thinking about Ground Zero, where there are so many discussions, so many stakeholders. Anyway, this was designed by Lawrence Halperin, Eminence Breeze of, the landscape of American Landscape Architecture, in collaboration with several sculptors. And it includes waterfalls, sculptures, and an incredible inscription, inscriptional program by John Benson. These are Roosevelt's words that are carved all over the, the monument. The monument was conceived of as four rooms to reflect FDR's 